air conditioning, brand new condenser on the Subaru Forester, all wheel drive. So I'm going through the process of vacuuming it right now for this new condenser that was installed. And it's always nice when they get OEM. This is at a really good shop. If anybody lives in the San Francisco area, this is one of the shops that has a good crew, good management, and they actually kept their employees employed all through COVID, took care of their employees, and they have a good working oil machine working here that's really efficient. And this is one of the problems with a lot of shops. You ever see shops are constantly losing guys, hiring new guys? They can never get a good team working together. Well, this is one of the shops that I go to that's on my A1 list where I bring my own cars and have family bring cars. Uh, has a good crew. And can't say that for all, but it's hard. It's not an easy job in this market. Um, it's even more difficult for a lot of owners nowadays with the short supply of trained technicians especially if the owner doesn't actually work out in a shop there's very few who are capable and competent enough to put together a training program and guide their technicians towards a higher level of quality and this is one of those shops where they strive and they actually exceed and actually achieve good quality work that's why i bring my own car here and that's why I have family. But let's get back to this one. So as you can see, this foam right here, this foam, if you get an aftermarket condenser, it will be missing this foam. And this foam, if I took it down, would let the hot air, you see where my finger tra uh, transfers right here? When the gasket goes up on the hood, the hood comes down and seals right against this. So the hot air cannot roll over and come over this way because this will be negative pressure because the fans are pulling from the inside. When you're in stop and go traffic, you're at idle at a stoplight and you suffer from cooling performance at that time, that's one of the problems, especially after an accident. You'll notice a lot of shops leave this out. Look down here. See how tight this is? See how they have two layers of foam stuck together and how incredible, I mean, that's airtight. I mean, that's, if it was solid rubber, it would be watertight, it's so tight. And then in here, in the plastic, I mean, you go, well, this is just worthless foam. That doesn't do anything. But when all the plastic fits around here, what that stops is the air from rolling around and coming around and reheating the condenser. This stuff is a must. It must be replaced. Uh, for you guys who are in really hot zones, like Arizona and stuff like that, or Texas, or anywhere really, really hot, all those plastic air dams that you think are unnecessary, a lot of guys who are uneducated, uneducated in the automotive industry and that own shops, think that it's not important to put back, see where my foot is down there? Think it's not important to put that plastic air dam on there. That's important because every time that vehicle comes to a stop or they're in, in stop and go heavy traffic, what happens is all this hot air back here will roll around if they're one of those shops who leave off the seal. It'll come around here, it'll come from underneath, and that hot air will, you know, it's 200 plus degrees, will literally roll up right in front of the condenser and reheat the condenser with hot air. This is why you gotta be careful on how cars are managed. Unfortunately, many people don't know this, and uh, it's a sad fact of our trade. And uh, just educating you on this. Okay, we're going into a nitrogen pressure decay test here. So I have it on the vacuum right now. We're down to 66 microns right now and still falling. We have it hooked up right here. So let's put in 200 PSI of nitrogen and do a vacuum decay test. This is gonna be a two part video because I'm gonna show you putting in the nitrogen, bringing it up to 200 PSI. Well, after that, it's going to be like watching grass grow or plants grow because you have to wait 10 or 15 minutes and let the tank and the system stabilize at that 200 PSI and just stay there, rock steady. And then you close the valve because now anything that's going to expand like rubber hoses or if there's any difference in temperature between the temperature of your gas in your bottle and the temperature of the vehicle, if you shoot uh, cold gas, into the vehicle, but the vehicle was running and it's really hot and it was outside, the cold gas will show a lower pressure, just a little bit. 
But then because the vehicle is 100 and some degrees and you already shut it off and you started your timer, the gas will start to heat up. And as gas expands, it expands and it makes more pressure. So you'll see growing pressure go up. But the opposite happens too. If your bottle was sitting in a hot location and the car was parked and still in a cold garage, but the gas is in a shed or somewhere hot. So now you have a tank that's 105 degrees. You have a car that's 65 degrees. And if you put that hot gas into the car and then instantly shut it off, go, I'm at 200 PSI, I close it off and I press go and start doing your uh, pressure leak decay, the gas will get cold because it's exposed to all the metal and the gas will contract and the pressure will go down. You go, oh my God, I have a leak. But no, you don't have a leak. You didn't let it stabilize first. So let's go through that process right now. All right, so I close off the low side. My high side is open. I'm gonna shoot in the gas in the high side and let's see what happens and see how, if, if I think I remember this has a, does this have a hard shut off expansion valve? Well, guess what? We're gonna find out right now because if it does have a hard shut off expansion valve, it will not let all the pressure go to the low side. It'll, some of it will go through and then somewhere around 60 PSI or 80 PSI, maybe 100, it will stop and it won't let no more through. If it's an open expansion valve, it'll just let it go right through to the low side and come up on the other side. So let's do this right now. We're closing the vacuum. That's closed. I have this open. I know I have that cranked in with my broken gauges that don't work. I do everything by feel, not OSHA approved. Now let's put in a little pressure. Going up, going up. Oh, looks like I gotta crank some more in there. And do a little more. Uh, crank a little more in there. Oh, I think I'm out of gas. I know, I might make it. I'm running low on gas, so I could tell that. That last crank should have sent it to the moon but it didn't. And so as you see, we do not have a hard shutoff expansion valve. It went right from the high side because the low side is closed through here and went all the way through. And I exceeded a little bit. So I just shut off the nitrogen. Okay, so we're close to my target pressure of 200 psi and the reason i do this is a micro channel this is a strong evaporator this is not a 1960 cadillac with the big bellow uh, evaporators i normally would not do a 60 year old car 80 year old car or even a 50 year old car with those large evaporators at this pressure on an evaporator you'll create a leak okay so now i'm not going to start the pressure test I'm gonna isolate the nitrogen. The nitrogen's off, let me open up this side too. Let's let it stabilize from side to side. So these stay open, the high and the low side are gonna stay open. They don't have to actually. And um, you wait, say 10 minutes, and you wait for the pressure, you wait for all the rubber hoses to relax, they might stretch a little, and the pressure will drop down a few tenths and you wait for that to happen. And then when you come back, you're gonna hit this button, the tightness test. And um, I might just jump the gun here, not wait 10 minutes, just so I could get this started so I could do the next video. Now see, see it just dropped, just, it's like on the verge of dropping right there. And then in a second, this one will verge or drop too, because it's doing its thing right now. And this is why you wait 10 minutes. And then you hit the tightness test, and then you go for 10 minutes after that and you take a, t a test after that. But I'm trying to hurry up the video so I could get to my next job. I do have to get out of here and get to the jobs and videos take up a bit of time. That's why I'm only allowed to do one video a day on one car a day. All right, guys, I'll be back. And um, I think I'll, I'll hit the tightness test right now and we'll probably see what will happen is you'll see one or two tenths drop another down to about three or two microns of loss because I'm not gonna wait 10 minutes, but then it'll just stabilize and stay right there. So let's do that right now. We're gonna hit the tightness test. There, now it's into the test mode, but it's not on yet because I have not hit enter. 
Once I hit enter, this clock will start timing down. And then over in this blank spot right here, it will tell you how many tenths of a PSI you have lost over how many minutes over time. So let's get that done. I'm gonna hit the enter. There you go. We're displaying the time is doing the t timer. And then we got 0, 0.0 because we have not lost any pressure. And you notice it's 0.4, not by worth counting in tenths of a PSI. That's how accurate these gauges are. All right, let's come back to the next video. I'm gonna wait 10 minutes and we'll see what happened. And we'll see that this goes down to two microns. I mean, two tenths loss, maybe one. Uh, yeah, let's see if we lose. So we're, we're in the verge from four to three. Let's take off two tenths, um, two one. So we'll come back to 2.1 PSI in 10 minutes. Let's see how accurate I am. And that's no loss from a leak. That's a loss from my hotter gas that was in my vehicle coming into a car that was cold sitting overnight. So the car is somewhere around 60 degrees Fahrenheit, but my tank is a lot hotter. All right, see you, see you soon.